we go down the corridor and they go, George Lucas is on the phone. And I was like, what? You know, and it suddenly got whisked into this room and there was a phone off the hook. I was like, hello. And, and in my, and I do this every time where I'm like, okay, everyone's going to ask me what, what he said. And I, in my brain, I'm grabbing a cassette tape and putting it in and hitting record and remember this, remember this. And I'm so in awe that it's George that I played the tape back at the end and it was just <laughs> Prepare your ears, humans. Happy, sad, confused begins now. I'm Josh Horowitz and today on Happy, Sad, Confused, it's the only filmmaker in history that I know of to direct both Darth Vader and Godzilla. He's made four feature films and as far as I'm concerned, he's four for four monsters. Godzilla, Rogue One, and now his original sci-fi epic. Yes, it's actually original, guys. It's possible. The creator, it's Gareth Edwards on Happy, Sad, Confused for the very first time. Hi, Gareth. Hey, Josh. How you doing? I'm doing great. Congrats on the movie, man. Um, I, I'll, I'll preface this by saying I, I meant what I said. I, I, I think you're a very fine filmmaker. You're making good movies. So congratulations, buddy, on this one. Thank you. I don't trust anything anyone tells me. Like I, I, every time I meet someone who works in this industry, like I crank up my compliments, like by double. Oh, I get it. Yeah. And so so like, that's why I'm, o I'm overcompensating because you know, yeah. you can, you can. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm har I'm harbing yeah. what you're saying. So just <laughs> mind. Cool. Does, does anybody ever come up to you and say, you know, Godzilla, it wasn't for me. That wasn't my, like, does anyone actually oh. ever say something like that? Totally. Oh, <laughs> what do you want about all the time? Yeah. Um, <laughs> like the weirdest thing is the first movie I did was this very low independent, low budget independent movie. And you go and do the, all the film festivals around the world. And this very awkward thing happens at every single screening where they say, stick around. The, the filmmaker is going to be for, you know, uh, doing a Q and A after the screening sort of thing. And so essentially you got the whole theater and then anyone who hated the movie just thinks I'm, I don't want this, you know, hang around for this Q and A and they just start leaving, but you're by the door, right? So they all have to push past you and shuffle past you to get out. And so you basically, everyone who like about a third of the audience might empty and everyone who walks past you, you're like, you feel like apologizing to them. Go, I'm sorry. You didn't like it. I'm really sorry. Like, and they, and they probably don't know it's you. They might be mumbling something about the movie. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't out. want to accidentally over here. And then the awkwardest moment was, I won't mention the film festival, but I was going down an escalator afterwards and I just happened to like, stand next to and it's like one of the longest escalators in the world and i happened to stand next to this couple and one of the guys went um oh uh congratulations i really loved your film and i was like oh thanks and he went she hated it and i looked at his wife and she was nodding like yeah it was i hated it <laughs> and then it was like and then we both stood in silence <laughs> for like the longest <laughs> escalator ride in the history right. of the world and it was like why, why why tell someone that but okay Oh, Hollywood. So good for the self-esteem, you would think. But um, I mean, we're, in terms of like the process of making films, when is the time when there's the most anxiety? Is it at the writing you know, stage? Is it during production? Is it this stage? Like, when do you feel kind of like the anxiety? The, the... They all kind of compete with each other to be the worst, <laughs> the worst moment. Um, Pre-production, there's no anxiety. Pre-production right. is like... Where you well, the get... movie's still perfect. The movie, can't, yeah. there's no problems with it. Yeah. It's a masterpiece at that point. It's like right. going to be the greatest <laughs> film ever made. And every, you know, you're really sure of that. And, and so that's really, that's fine, that bit. Then what happens, the way I sort of view it is like a graph. And as you're writing the movie, the graph goes up and up and up, probably right. to its highest ever point, where in your mind, you're making Citizen Kane. Right. And then you start filming. And as you film every day, that graph goes down. <laughs> Yeah. and down and down and down and down to like probably the lowest point is like when you watch the assembly so you sort of watch the, the cut yeah. and then and then in post it starts to go back up and up and you you kind of crawl your way back up and obviously the ultimate goal is to get to the heights you originally were and you never really know you know how well you're doing obviously and so that I'd say a very anxious moment is probably where we're at now where everyone's about to see it and you know you're gonna give it in you know give it over to the world and well, and the complicating escalator again, right? <laughs> the metaphorical escalator or literal yeah. sometimes, yeah. but I mean, the complicated thing obviously is also, it's a different thing. It's not what you endeavor to do on day one of the shoot, especially given the way you approach things, starting in monsters and in a way how you've kind of returned to seemingly in this one, you very much live and breathe in that kind of organic gorilla space. Like, it seems like you thrive on that and, and, you know, you're not the type of filmmaker to kind of like shoot the storyboard and be like, we nailed it. 
you need it to kind of feel like a little alive in the moment, don't you? Yeah, I mean, there's always like, I think if you just literally, I feel very down and depressed if all I got was what I was picturing in my head. Right. Because there's a limit to how good that can be. Like you're kind of subconsciously pulling from other films and visuals you've seen and stuff like this to kind of create hopefully this kind of more, you know, new thing. And, and it's like, all you're doing creatively the entire time you're making a film in every single way is trying to like i see them as like an organism right there's my dna there's like the idea i had and then i'm trying to let in other dna of either other people like the actors or designers or people that worked on the film or even stuff like the weather or the location just not quite right. being what you expected and then suddenly this new thing is born that is like a merge of two other things and that's when you get stuff that feels new and fresh when it's sort of like that's the hardest thing to do with filmmaking is like sort of smash up your plan and build it back together and if you arrive exactly where you were then it tells you okay maybe there's something in that and it was but often you arrive at something else and go oh i'm kind of glad that happened we would never ever have chosen that but now it feels like that's probably one of the most unique things about the movie is when when something goes wrong and also add in of course um the filmmaker influences the, the the folks that you grew up on we're we're of a, almost the exact same age and i know you've talked about some of your influences and i'd like to kind of start this conversation a little bit by talking about some of those filmmakers that you've mentioned in the past because i see them in your work i see them in the creator and different elements and there's nothing to apologize for these are the greats and you're making it your own but like spielberg for everybody of our age and the generation is of course looms large and i certainly see Close Encounters. I saw it in, in Godzilla, that sense of place, that sense of scope. Um, what's your Spielberg Mount Rushmore? Does he recur in your vocabulary just every day you make a movie? Yeah, I think more, probably more than any other filmmaker in that. Um, I think I watched his films from a directing point of view. I probably watched Spielberg movies more than any other film as a kid and tried to learn about like shot construction. Mm -hmm. And I would start, I, I remember getting thrown out of class when I was 10 for being naughty. And, um, and so I spent the hour that I had outside the class storyboarding. So I knew I wanted, like I used that as like, well, I definitely knew about directing then and wanted to be a filmmaker. And I, and I was very much influenced by like Raiders of the Lost Ark. Like I'd watch that over and over. And there's something about the way that movie's constructed, like from a storyboard style kind of view um, that, it's like a vocabulary, like, like the words I'm using right now, I didn't invent English, right? You know, your parents speak to you in English right. and, you know, it kind of gets stuck in your brain. And, and so you speak English and, and if you watch Spielberg movies or, you know, James Cameron a billion times as a child, you know, maybe you're going to talk a little bit with that accent, you know, when you get to make a film and, and I'm very, I mean, they're my heroes. I think, you know, you know, you name the movie, but it's like, um, you know, if I ever made, if you ever made a film as close to those seminal films that I grew up with, um, I could, I could die happy. And the thing that makes you keep going back to make another movie is you're like, gotta, I gotta get closer. You know what I mean? Like those guys, right. they did multiple masterpieces. You've got like, it's such a high benchmark. It's, it's, I don't know how they, it was a different era back then. And then I kind of like to blame the era. <laughs> because it's so hard to make something that great. I mean, they're very special, those filmmakers. No, but honestly, and I'm not just blowing smoke, I think you're, you're a throwback in that way, in the way that you're tackling genre. It reminds me of these guys, and I'll throw in like folks like Verhoeven and Cameron and all, you know, they're, they're all dealing with heady, heady subjects, but making it fun and, and, and bringing emotion to what, you know, back in the day was considered kind of like, you know, that, that those side genres that we don't treat with dignity. Mm -hmm. um, you, 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 you've talked about Lucas, of course. You obviously made your own Star Wars movie. How, how much blubbering did you do when he told you how much he loved Rogue One? Did the tears immediately come? Like, did that blow your brain apart when he complimented you on your film? Um, no, because, I, I mean, I, I cherished, I had, we showed him around the set. He came to visit Pinewood at one point and had a day where we sort of showed him everything. And that just felt the most surreal thing in the world to be showing George Lucas star wars film that he wasn't part of it felt wrong right. in that sense right. and and then yeah he did basically we were doing exactly this for rogue one i was sat exactly like this you know right and 
and doing interviews. And there was this person hovering by the door and they were like, and it was like, what? And then suddenly it sort of stopped. And they said, Gareth's just got to take a break. And I had no idea what was going on. And we go down the corridor and they go, George Lucas is on the phone. And I was like, what? You know, and it suddenly got whisked into this room and there was a phone off the hook. I was like, hello. And, and in my, and I do this every time where I'm like, okay, everyone's going to ask me what, what he said, everyone who works with me. So, so, and I, in my brain, I'm grabbing a cassette tape and putting it in and hitting record and remember this, remember this. And I'm so in awe that it's George, that he was highly compromised. Like he was very, he was very kind, but the, I played the tape back at the end and it was just <laughs> like, it was the driving like, around teacher yeah yeah i couldn't store any of it you know it's your hero <laughs> talking to you it was like it was um it yeah it's like i know i'm in the matrix i know this is not real i'm a big believer in the in the simulation hypothesis because i shouldn't get to do a star wars film and have you also for you. <laughs> it happened it happened uh james cameron obviously looms large for for all of us and in a way you know the creator feels like the realization of judgment day we kind of like the what we never saw in his terminator movies in, in, in a slight way have you crossed paths with with cameron and those terminator films must loom large for you oh yeah totally no i never i never i've never met james cameron um i when my six on my 16th birthday i asked for money off everybody because my intention was to go down to the to the secondhand store or the we had, it's like radio rentals in the UK, I think Radio Shack in America. Sure. And, and they basically had a secondhand, mis, like a used old VHS cassette player. And I was like, oh my God, it was my dream to have my own VHS cassette player in my bedroom so I could just watch films whenever I wanted. And I, as soon as I got home, I put the Terminator in and it never left that cassette player for like a few months. Every time it got to the end, I just rewound it, play again. And would do work and things like I would tend to do homework and it was just on like um like like wallpaper in the room um and I got to be able to quote that movie off by heart it's I think it's I mean technically it's not his debut right because of Piranha 2 right, but right. I'll just brush over that <laughs> uh, like it's I think it's one of the greatest debuts ever he's talked about if and when he goes back to Terminator which he's teased using AI as his way in so maybe now that the the student can become the teacher maybe you can tell him a thing or two about ai i don't think you can tell james cameron anything he doesn't already know <laughs> he's the smartest man in the universe kind of is yeah, yeah i think so. <laughs> uh you always mention apocalypse now and i think when folks see this movie they're going to see a really unique blend of a lot of different things including a war film a vietnam film uh, i mean there's definitely an influence there uh apocalypse now i think for for many of us again, blew our minds when we saw it. Seeing that and then the documentary, right? Heart of Darkness. Hopefully your films aren't quite as chaotic as that, but is that a little bit of what you're trying to touch? A little bit of that magic in that film? Yeah, you know what's funny is I saw Apocalypse Now, I think it was about 17, 16, 17 when I first saw it. And, and I knew this was allegedly the greatest war movie ever made. And so there was such a high bar set by that. And I remember putting it in, hitting play and watching it during the day, uh, uh, when I was at college and got to the end and I was like, it's okay. Right. And I, I don't know what I was expecting, but I had this kind of reaction and like right. all great movies like that I had the same kind of reaction to 2001. Right. And then I would go a day or so and I'd be thinking about the film loads and I'd go, I'm going to watch that again. Cause I, I just get pulled back into it and you hit play again. And the second time you watch you go, that's pretty good actually. And then I'd go about a few more days and I'd go, let me watch it one more time. And they'd be like, Oh my God, I think it's kind of a masterpiece. And, and there's these films that if you're not exposed to them when they first came out to the cinema, you get told they're, they're special and you obviously revisit them at some point. And, and I think if you, if you weren't in that particular timeline when, when what they were doing was unique, because they've been copied since, you know. Right. And then the first viewing, if I'm honest with a lot of these films, I don't quite get it sometimes. And but I find if it's a really, if it is a strong movie, you, you just be gravitationally pulled back to it and watch it a second time. And then you'll think even better of it. And I think now Apocalypse Now is, if someone said it's the greatest movie ever made, I would not argue with them. There's like a whole bunch of films people could say that about and I wouldn't argue with them, but it's it's hard to put things into like, which is your favorite, Right. You know? but um, it's in the top, whatever the top handful is, it's in there. 
did it come up a lot in the production of this one? Because it does feel like Joshua, your protagonist, is on this journey. He's kind of caught in, and, and there's shades of gray. Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? He's kind of on this this quest. And I, I don't yeah. know, I, 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 the sense of place again, it, it feels like it's definitely there. I mean, it's a mass, that's a masterpiece. I'm not equating our film to anything like that. Well, but but the um, but I do feel like there was a you have to get into a shorthand with when the hardest thing about or one of the hardest things about making a film is that at some point someone tries to get you to say it in three sentences. Right. And you're like, if I could summarize this film in three sentences, I wouldn't have made it. Do you know what I mean like the shortest? Yeah. I'm really sorry, but the shortest I can manage is two hours and we hit play. <laughs> like that's kind of what the movie is. That's the whole point. Yeah. Yeah. And so. But so you look for little fast ways of talking about the movie and the fastest way we I just accidentally landed on at one point and it kind of felt right was if someone made Apocalypse Now in the Blade Runner universe, right. that was kind of like the really quick way. And both those films are like phenomenal, like legendary masterpieces. So I'm not in any way saying our films like that, but uh, it was a, was a quick explanation to people who would be like, oh, okay, that's really interesting. No, I get it. You're saying you're better than Ridley Scott and Francis Ford <laughs> Coppola put together. And that's cool. I mean, I, humility is overrated. Yeah. I think if the two of them were together, no, no, I wouldn't. But individually, yeah. No. Right. <laughs> no, I'm but I hope it, I hope it's okay that we're geeking out on filmmakers. But like the only, the other one I want to mention, because we again we always comes up is Tarantino. Okay. And and Tarantino's been mentioned. I read this somewhere. I don't know if you've substantiated it, that he acknowledged that he cried. I think as I did watching spoiler alert for the opening 20 minutes of Godzilla, you have an amazing sequence at the beginning of that, of that film in which Juliet Binoche dies and it's so dramatic and powerfully done. And apparently it brought Quentin to tears. Have you heard that? I did read something like that when he spoke to her, he told her that story or something, um, yeah. which is amazing if that's true. And I, and that's all on her. Like she did such a great performance. Um, yeah, no, Tara, I saw Reservoir Dogs seven times at the cinema it blew my mind. I think it was probably because it was the first, I was 16 when it came out. And it was the first film that was like, pulling from world cinema and classic, you know, a, a whole genre of films that I probably wasn't fully exposed to back then. And kind of made this like perfect little movie, you know, with with those influences. And, and just blew my mind completely. And, and a friend of mine, uh, we were at college, so I was 16 or 17. And and he went up to a film festival in Nottingham called Shots in the Dark Film Festival. And um, he just called me really excitedly one day and went, I've just met Quentin Tarantino. And I was like, what? And he was like, he's here at the festival. He's doing a Q&A, but he's here the whole week. He's watching all the films. And I just saw him in the cafe thing, you know, and I asked him for an autograph. And I was like, I just got in my car and I went. It's like, it's, in the UK, that's quite a big deal. Right. To go from where I live to Nottingham. So I just drove for like two hours. And then we were looking for him everywhere. And um, and then sort of saw him in this in this in the gift shop, and went up to him and I told him I'd seen Reservoir Dogs seven times and I think I, I just looked like some weird geeky like stalkery freak like can you you know like stay away? Right. And then we went in to watch this movie called Le Samurai, which is like this sort of oh yeah I just noir, saw it for the first time yeah great movie yeah, like yeah French yeah. noir film and yeah. we and we go in and we're trying to look for an empty seat and there's an empty seat next to Tarantino. And so we're like all pushing and fighting each other to go and sit next to Tarantino. So we ended up sitting next to him and he lent, he was like, Hey, how you doing? And we're like, yeah, good. And he's like, have you seen this movie? And we were like, no. And he's like, oh, you're going to love it. And he spent the movie watching us, our reaction. <laughs> like he was looking at us more than he was looking at the screen. It felt like, and so I was like really overreacting to everything. Like, like, right. oh, my, oh no, you know, I was doing like one of those YouTube, like, Right. And it's not quite that kind of movie that elicits those no, kind of reactions. No, but because you could feel him looking at you, it's like, I've got to look like I'm loving this because right. you know. let's talk about our great returning sponsor and happy say confused. It's of course ZocDoc. Guys, how often has this happened to you? You're on the hunt for a new doctor. You ask everybody you know under the sun for the recommendations. They give you one and you find the doctor and they seem great. They make you feel so comfortable. You've searched and you've found the one. You call the office. They have the appointment available. Yes, it's all happening. And then, drum roll, you know what happens. The doctor doesn't take your insurance. Okay, listen to me. 
wipe away your tears, put away the ice cream, and head over to ZocDoc to find and book the doctor who is both right for you and yes, takes your insurance. ZocDoc is a free app where you can find amazing doctors and book appointments online. We're talking about booking appointments with thousands of top rated patient review doctors and specialists. You can filter specifically for ones that take your insurance, yes, are located near you, yes, and treat almost any condition you're searching for. They've got verified reviews from actual real patients, not bots. And the average wait time to see a doctor booked on ZocDoc it's just 24 to 48 hours. If and when I ever need a doctor, I turn to ZocDoc. So go to ZocDoc.com slash happy sad, download the ZocDoc app for free, then find and book a top rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash happy sad, ZocDoc.com slash happy sad. Did it feel like when you made Monsters, I know that, like there was a lot of years where you were kind of toiling and trying to get there to become a feature film director. Did you feel like you were immediately welcome to a club? Like that you were like, you were in and that some filmmakers kind of reached out and embraced you that your I, life had changed pretty quickly? I am not in any club whatsoever. Like, I don't know what, <laughs> if you know where the club is, please tell me and I'll, I'll knock on the door. Cause no, you don't, I don't feel like that at all. And no. Not at all. Like, I still feel outside the club. I don't know if there is a club. Everyone you speak to feels that way, I think. Like, there's this perception that there's this, like, Illuminati gathering of, like, all these uber filmmakers and actors. And and if there is, like, I, they ne I'm never invited to it, so. <laughs> what about the, the, the jump from Monsters to Godzilla? Um, I don't think there's ever probably been that giant a budget jump from a first time feature to a second feature um first films what like half a million if that and godzilla i don't know 150 million something like that but besides like much better craft service did it feel like what was the biggest jump for you did you feel because i guess the one of the weird phenomenon of something like that is like you probably have less experience on that set than a lot of the people around you the actors your your crew was that an odd place to be on your second feature? Yeah, I think there was like an imposter syndrome for a lot of it. Um, it was, but also in a really weird way, like when you dream about doing this as a kid, I guess it's like, if you dreamt about playing in the Super Bowl, you know what I mean? Like if, you're, if you wanted to play in the NFL and that's all you picture is when you're on the playground, that's what you're picturing, do you know what I mean? Right. In a very strange way, if you end up in the Super Bowl, as weird as it is, it also feels like, of course, Very familiar. right? Because yeah. this is this yeah. is what we always pictured, you know. And so it's a got there's a strange like you have a um, schizophrenic feeling about it, where you're half like this is so weird, I shouldn't be here. How did this happen? And I honestly spent that whole time thinking, this this is not real. And they're gonna at some point they're gonna go. It was really nice to meet you, Gareth, and we really enjoyed everything. But um, Tim Burton's coming in now. <laughs> like, like you're a contest winner like we yeah. gave you a week on set congratulations yeah. go back yeah. to your old life <laughs> yeah and so i really kept waiting for i kept looking around like if anyone famous any you know actor like director turned up it would scare the hell out of me like oh here we go um yeah and to be to tell a story about the heroes of it all I and mean, when you're asking like did you ever get affected by this sort of thing when we finished so you I don't know if you're familiar with publicity tours where some filmmaker has to sit in front of a camera and do a million interviews, um, but apparently they exist. They, um, <laughs> they, so we had to do that for Godzilla and I was fried by the end of it. And we were like, with me and the writer, Max Bernstein, we were like, let's go have a party. Let's just do something. We've got to celebrate this. So we were like, okay, let we go to the Cinerama Dome. We'll watch the movie and then we'll all go back to, we'll hire a house and we'll just all have a, like a house party and have drinks with all these people. So we did that and we got to the house party and one at a time I could feel this queue of people wanting to talk, talk to me. And each one had one of the questions from the publicity tour. Like, what was it like working with Brian Cranston? Right. What was it like? Right. And, and I was like, I can't do this. I can't do this. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I got, I got to go. And so me and a friend, we just went, we just went down into Hollywood and very drunk. And then at about 2 a.m., 3 a.m., I look at my phone and there's a, an email and I recognize the email address and it's Peter Jackson's email. And I'm like, Peter Jackson's emailing. And I look and there was a video attachment 
and I open up the video and I'm in a, I'm in a nightclub. So it's like, <laughs> and I look at the video and there's a guy with gray, sort of gray hair and a beard. And, and I'm thinking, is this Gandalf? You know what I mean? And like, I don't, <laughs> don't know what's going on. This is really weird. And so I go out. What did you take at the club, Gareth? What did someone? <laughs> well, this is what I was thinking. I was like, someone's <laughs> dropped some in my drink because I'm starting to hallucinate. And so I go outside and I start putting my headphones on and it's got like, what is this? And as soon as I put the headphones in, I recognized the voice and it was Steven Spielberg and, and Peter Jackson was filming him on his camera, on his, on his phone. And, um, and basically Spielberg had just watched Godzilla. And Peter was like, I know Gareth, he'll really want to hear this because he was saying something about it. And he was like, let me film you and send it to him. And Steve Spielberg started speaking about Godzilla and it was nice to hear it. And I just started crying. Like I just, I, I literally collapsed and I just went in, I I'd hardly ever cry. And I just started, it just felt like that's why I did it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that, it, every, all the pain of whatever it was is worth it for that little video clip. You know what I mean? It meant, it meant the absolute world to me. It was kind of like, um, yeah, it was. I, I think, I think your theory is right. I think it's a simulation. I'm sorry to say, cause that doesn't happen. That's not real. That is not supposed to happen. It's never happened so <laughs> either. It's like, that was it. That's all I'm getting. Well, you've had some more pinch me moments. I mean, so so Star Wars, I've never heard the story of how you actually got the gig. Like, did you meet with Kathy about like an amorphous role in Star Wars? Like, were you up for like the saga films too? Or was it always specifically Rogue One? Did you have to kind of like make a pitch? Like what, what happened? Yeah, it wasn't quite what you would think in that sense. Because... I was, so I was finishing Godzilla when, what, basically when we went, Godzilla, as you know, was set in San Francisco. So we went up to San Francisco and we were there and, we, and actually went to Industrial Light and Magic by the Yoda fountain, just because I wanted a photograph. <laughs> and, and that's the day it broke that Disney had bought Lucasfilm. Right. And we all started hypothesizing, oh, I wonder what they're going to do. I wonder, oh, maybe more Star Wars films. And we're all sitting there talking like this. And then slowly, I can't remember, I wasn't paying loads of attention, but you get the impression that lots of filmmakers were meeting with them. Right. And I think they'd announced JJ was doing what we, what turned out to be The Force Awakens at that point. I can't remember. But anyway, that felt like it was all happening. And in my head, there was no part of me that thought I would ever be considered for anything. And so just getting on with making this film. And then I got an email out of the blue from Kiri Hart um, saying, Do you, you know, I hear you're a fan of Star Wars. Would you like to meet up? And my assumption was they're, re they're talking to 3,000 filmmakers. I'm, I'm number 2,998, you know, right. and, and so it's my turn to go in and just have a quick chat and I couldn't meet them because I was shooting a movie. There was no way on earth. And it was like really painful to write an email back saying, I'm so sorry, but I can't, I can't meet right now. And I asked like maybe in a few couple of months, but in my heart, I was thinking if this, if this is serious, they'll come back and say, could you, is there any way we could do a zoom? Right. And so I batted it away for a bit. And then we were in post-production and they asked again, do you want to come in and meet? And I was like, sure. And we, we were at Warner Brothers, which is right next door to Disney in Burbank. And I, I didn't tell anyone that I was going for a meeting. And so I pretended I like had to go to the loo or something, or I was feeling ill or something. I don't know what they thought. And I just got out. I just left the edit, quickly ran down the street, or I don't know what, got in my car and drove. It's only like a block away or so. And then um when i met with kiri and had this great conversation where i talked about how geeky a star wars fan i was i guess and i, I on my 30th birthday i actually went to tunisia and i stayed in luke skywalker's house and so oh my god I've, I've looked up that that hotel yeah it's it, it does not get good reviews online it's not um, uh i mean they're they're that's that's not that's not their fault that's it's an amazing thing to do it was like mecca to me to sort of i actually no, it seems amazing i just yeah yeah i took blue milk i'm mean, sorry blue dye and i put it in milk so i kept blue I milk on, the, on the very table that this is my 30th birthday and then we went you have to drive across the country to get to the igloo and i watched right. the sunset and so i did really geeky things like that and as you're doing that it's very there wasn't very many people back then and you'd sometimes cross paths with other couples like i was with my girlfriend right. at the time and there'd be some like some guy who looked just like you, probably a graphic designer, probably a VFX <laughs> artist, and he, with this really bored girlfriend, and they would exchange looks like you too, huh? You know, getting dragged around Star Wars sets, and and so I, I sort of explained that story, and then she, she that went really well, and I thought, and she said, what do you? I kind of maybe they asked about what I think Star, what kind of film you should do in Star Wars, and I don't know what I said, 
But then at the end of that interview or chat, I just got sent an email and it said, here's two ideas for a Star Wars film. Would you be interested in either of them? And it's like so rare you get a phenomenal email like that. Right. And I was busy and I was like, I'm not opening this until I've got time to read it properly. And so, and I knew, and it, it sounds crazy, but I didn't have time till the weekend. And so I waited until no one was around because I thought I'm never going to get this chance again. And I made sure like, I locked the door, opened up the email, and there were these two ideas for a movie. And I read one and I was like, and I got to the end. And in my head, I thought, I can see why they want to do that. I'm... I'm not the guy for that. I'm really curious what this other idea is, you know, and I started reading it and I was like, where's this going? Where's this going? And it, you know, that was the pitch that John Knoll did, right? Like two pages or so and, and sort of read it. And I was still spent the whole time going, where is this going? What is this? And then right at the end, it was, you know, spoiler alert, but blah, 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 princess Leia, you know? Right. And I was like, oh my God, this is like the connected, you know, prequel to a new hope which is my favorite, you know, the whole reason I'm doing anything. And I spent the first 10, 20 minutes going, you can't make this film. This is like sacrilegious, you know, like this shouldn't happen. And then ended up, um, and as soon you realize, but are they offering this me? And, and went back in and I, I honestly thought they were talking to like 10, 20 people about that movie. And I was one of them. And so I went in and talked about it and what I think you should and shouldn't do. And Kathy with Kathy, and and I think I went for another chat. I cannot remember, but at one point I was like, I need to know just for my own peace of mind how many people they're talking to. Right. And so I just sort of went, Oh, how many other filmmakers are you talking to about this idea? And they went, Oh, none, just you. And I was like, Okay, when would you do this? And they were like, It'd be our next film. And it was like. I had to act all like, oh yeah, sure, cool, you know. Right. So in this is head, a I'm go like, project. You want me, and it's yeah. an awesome idea. Let me get this straight. Okay. Yeah. You, you go. Hang on. And you go. You know, I didn't do the raid, right? You know, I'm not Gareth Evans. You know, like. like no, something. go with it, Gareth. Just go with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what and, was the so? What was the other idea? Was it the Boba Fett? What was the? I I cannot talk about it because I, I assume they're going to make that film, you know, at some point, and it'll be a great movie. I just it wasn't. Is Either it something point. we've heard about or is it something I've never heard of, you think? Uh, no comment. <laughs> okay, fair enough, fair enough. Guys, check the calendar. It's 2023. You need a VPN in your life and not just any VPN. You need the best VPN out there. That's why you need to go to nordvpn.com slash happy sad. Get the exclusive deal offered to just you beloved happy sad confused listeners and watchers because... I use NordVPN because I need to access the entire World Wide Web no matter where I am. If I'm traveling around the world, I don't want to get blocked. I don't want to be watched. I need the freedom that NordVPN can provide. Their mission, it's a simple one, but a worthy one. They strive to make the internet better than it is today. Yes, the internet can be free from online threats, censorship, and surveillance. That's why you need to go to nordvpn.com slash happy sad. And not only that, if you use that URL, guys, you're going to get an exclusive offer just for you guys. Use it. Use what I'm giving you guys because NordVPN is so popular. It's so great because it does all these things and more. You can become safer online with a single click. You're not going to miss any of your favorite content even when traveling. You can stay safe from malware with threat protection. Plus, it's more than a VPN, guys. They offer you a dark web monitor that notifies you if someone leaks your credentials. They have MeshNet that allows you to connect to your devices remotely and securely. They have a dedicated IP that helps you avoid block lists. They are more than obsessed than I am even with privacy. They don't track or share what you do online. Your traffic is always protected with robust encryption. They are the VPN to use. Go to nordvpn.com slash happy sad to get your exclusive offer today. Rogue One is, is a miracle. Any any great movie is a miracle. It's it, it it works so well. It is fantastic. And I'm curious, like, what your relationship is as like and as the creator owner, a creative owner of a film like that. Like, do you feel the creative authorship of Rogue One that you feel for an original thing like the creator or monsters? I mean, there's so much. There's so many cooks in the kitchen, frankly, 
on something that that of that size. So, what is but, your relationship to Rogue One? Is that is that your film? No, honestly, what I feel all the time uh, is it's George's film. Like, like basically everything in that movie that's any good that people love is probably somehow from George Lucas in some way. And like the fact that I, we didn't realize this when we were shooting it, but everyone obviously, the thing that, you get, that gets talked about the most is the Darth Vader scene at the end. Right. And I take zero, like I feel zero ownership of that because it's George's character. Do you know what I mean? George invented that corridor. He invented that character. I mean, sorry, that character. And and the lightsabers and the rebels and do you know what I mean? And the Death Star plans. And it's like, it, it, the I, you know, so you, it's very, like when, so, so, okay, this is what you kind of happens when you're a filmmaker and especially a sci-fi geek like I am, is I go into comic book shops a lot and, and those sort of stores, you know, um, and I walk around and I'm mainly looking for other stuff and just there as a fan. But you can't, you're, you're lying to yourself. If a little bit of the, in the corner of your eye, you sometimes don't go, oh, is that from our film? You know, whatever it, like whether it be Godzilla <laughs> right. or Rogue One. And if I spot our Godzilla, you know, that's like our design, not the Toho, um, I sort of feel a little like, yeah, you know, and, <laughs> and the same, but the problem is with Rogue One is when I see Darth Vader, I'm like, that's not because of our film. That's because of, you know, the original trilogy, which totally rightly so. And and so there's a, it's very hard to see something where it's just because of Rogue One. Do you know what I mean? Right. It's usually because of Star Wars as a whole. Um, so yeah, I, I always feel like I got to play with those toys, which was amazing. Um, but any, the real, you know, if someone's so, going to- It's all statue, George, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Does, the, does the conjecture, the endless conjecture about that production bother you? The reality is that all these giant films have major additional photography, yet there is this kind of war, as you well know, about this film, about who did what and Tony's involvement, was Filoni involved, etc. Do you sweat that stuff? Does it bother you? Do you feel a need to set the record straight or is it all good? No, I think I just, yeah, I mean, every movie, you know what's weird is this the creator, we didn't do additional photography. Every single film I've done other than this one, we've always gone back and shot a bunch of stuff. Yeah. And I always expected to, I always joked with the actors when we were doing the creator, like, um, see you in nine months right. for the pickup right. shoot. You know what I mean? Like, and we say goodbye, like people in Thailand we'd never see for ages, you know, and you say, it's okay, we're coming back in nine months. You know, we're gonna come back in nine months. And we didn't. And, uh, <laughs> and that was weird because it is very normal to do that. Um, I think in terms of Rogue One, like, look, I got to, I got to, making films is very hard, right? And I got to, I think I got to make a film in the, in probably the best world and story that anyone, I could ever hope to be offered. Yeah. And, and the idea of like nitpicking or complaining about some aspect of it feels really ungrateful. And yep. so I'm, I'm sort of, even if I went back in time, I wouldn't do anything differently. You know, it all, at the end of the day, people aren't shouting at me across the street saying I ruined their childhood. So. Right. And it's more than that. Look, and, and you, and you have a prosperous career. You're able to make your own original film on a pretty big scale, like the creator and that film exists. So everyone won. It, it, it's all good. Um, yeah. Talk to me a little bit, I mean, full circle on, on the creator. So this is an original idea. This is obviously, look, elements are borrowed from different things, but you have created this out of whole cloth. Is there, is it possible to, possible to make a movie like this as a one-off nowadays? Or do you have to kind of like promise New Regency and Disney, like, oh, I've got other ideas. We can do more in this universe. You mean like to be a franchise? Like to- Yeah. No, no, we never talked about that. It was never on the table. Um... Hardest... That's kind of shocking nowadays, to be honest. Wouldn't you say? I mean, it's... No, I think what... Well, I mean, I can see why you think that, but I think what's shocking is that they even do it in the first place. Like, right. it's so hard to go... Like, I had a whole stack of conversations after Rogue One with lots of different people. And I was really interested in doing something original, you know, like the movies I grew up loving. And people will nod and say nice things in a room and then it'll go nowhere because because no one wants to put their money where their mouth is and and they've got a point you know they'll point at things track records of people taking big swings on on 
you know, non IP recently. And, and, and so really it's like, we can blame Hollywood as much as we want for just constantly doing sequels and franchises and, and not original material, but you know, it's a democracy to some extent and you get to vote with your cinema ticket and right. whatever you, whatever you go see is what they make. So I would just say to anyone listening to this is that it doesn't matter what you like, whatever the film is, it doesn't matter. Um, please go see it at the cinema because that's, that's what they're going to make more of. Um, and so I think early on in the, um, earlier in the summer or maybe late spring, we went into the studio and the head of marketing and everything, um, we talked about, we knew this strike was coming and there was the big dilemma of like, what do we do? Do we push? Do we stand our ground with right. our release date? Like, what do we do? And they brought up, they had every studio has one, right? They brought up this massive timeline on the computer and they've got this giant screens and stuff. And, and it was every movie coming out from when we, when we were talking back then till the like end of fall, you know, like this is everything available to everyone. And they, they sort of went, look at all these movies. There's not one thing here. That's not a sequel, uh, based on IP, a franchise or a book. And they were like, this is the only original thing. And they were like, if we take, if we don't do like, if we, like, what are we in this business for? If we move this, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, we're giving it, you know, we're kind of like giving up. And, and so I totally agree with that. And it felt really weird after the meeting to be outside and going, how did it come to this? When I was a kid, every week was an original film, you know, and that's the reason we have all these franchises is because of those movies. Um, a lot of them. Yeah, every every filmmaker we started out by talking about, whether it's yeah. Cameron with Terminator, Raiders, which is a, a blend of different kinds of things. I mean, Star Wars, these are inspired by other things, but they are big swings. The Matrix, these are big swings. And if we yeah. don't have these original big swings, we're not going to have the next generation of IP to, to yeah. talk about. So congratulations on this one, man. I, I really dug it. I love seeing John David. I'm obsessed with Alice and Janney in this film. Next time we'll chat about her. I need an action figure or something. She's amazing. Uh, I do encourage everybody to check out this film. And as I said, um, you're really killing it, man, as a filmmaker. And I and I, I hope to see more original ideas from you uh, in the future and more chats to come. Thanks, man. Thank you. And so ends another edition of Happy, Sad, Confused. Remember to review, rate, and subscribe to this show on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm a big podcast person. I'm Daisy Ridley and I definitely wasn't pressured to do this by Josh. <laughs>